All right, awesome. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I have a slide deck that I created from this podcast. However, there is so much detailed information in here. I kind of about three quarters of the way through decided that I should probably just spend this time listening to the professional explain it. And then maybe we can have a quick, you know, five, 10, 15 minute discussion at the end um, and talk about some of the more in depth things. But this guy that they interviewed is Robert Kiyosaki's personal account CPA. Um, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he's super, um, very, very smart guy. Um, he's also Ben Kinney's personal CPA. So I think um, that would be, are you guys cool with me doing that? With just playing it? So that way you guys get it from the source instead of my interpretation, which is scary to me. <laughs> um, all right, let me just double check. Actually, that's what I need to do. Okay. And we'll roll with this. And then if you guys um, have questions about it or, you know, just interrupt it and I can always put it on pause if you guys want to want to talk through it. But I think I haven't done this at all. So Angie and Stephanie, I, I promise I don't do this every time. But with the <laughs> tax, uh, with the tax topic, I felt like this was the best way to go. So let's roll. Welcome to the Win Make Give Wealth Series. Figure that out. We've planned your retirement with you. We've talked about how to save like Can crazy. That? We well, became students of health. Thank God we had Bob on that one for the math. And we've worked on increasing your income to create more opportunities for you. Yet as you increase your income, Ben, sometimes that means you have to pay a little bit more in taxes Yuck. sometimes. <laughs> Yuck. Today's episode is how to pay less taxes. Wow. Yay. Wow. Legally. <laughs> legally. Legally. He wants us legally. to be sure that we're talking legally. And ladies and gentlemen, like so many of these episodes, I'm taking you through the journey. I'm not your expert. I'm just walking hand in hand with you along the way. So today we are bringing a best-selling author, the guy who does Robert Kiyosaki's personal taxes. That's a the, smart guy. The published, the, the, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrants. This is Tom Wheelwright. Tom Wheelwright is the author of Tax-Free Wealth, one of the single most powerful books on money that I have ever read. Join Bob and I and Chad for a in-depth discussion with Mr. Tom Wheelwright. I'm so excited to be here today uh, with Bob Stewart, who, who's always with us, and Chad Himes. And today we're talking about paying less taxes. And what's the joke add-on that we always add every time, Bob? Legally. Legally, legally. Yeah. And there's no better expert in the nation than Tom Wheelwright. He is the author of one of, honestly, Tom, one of the most powerful financial books that I've ever read called uh, Tax-Free Wealth. And this completely changed my mindset on taxes and allowed me to understand that if I could legally minimize the amount of money I pay in taxes, I'd have a lot more money left over to build wealth and take care of my family in the future. And that's why we have Tom in here today, because he's, he's the leading expert. But Tom, why don't you tell them a little bit about your experience uh, in the industry and kind of where you're best known as, that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks. Um, by the way, Ben, uh, Bob, great to, to be with you today. Absolutely. I was like, anytime I get to talk about taxes, I'm get really excited. I'm I'm in heaven. So um, I I grew up just so you know I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, little Mormon boy. Um, spent two years as a Mormon missionary in Paris, France, where I learned all about how to get rejected. And, and, and then I did my undergraduate work at the University of Utah in accounting and my graduate work at the University of Texas with a, an emphasis in tax. And I spent the next seven years with uh, Ernst & Young, what's now Ernst Young, uh, one of the largest accounting firms in the world. 
including three years in the national tax office where I was uh, creating courses and teaching other CPAs. And then I spent four years as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company, 14 years as an adjunct professor at Arizona State University in their Masters of Tax program, and the last 25 years uh, building, selling, buying, um, developing CPA firms around the world. And uh, the last 10 or 12 years, uh, doing a lot of traveling with Mr. Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And we've literally been around the world multiple times talking to people about uh, building wealth and reducing taxes. And I'm probably best known, one of the ways I'm best known is as his tax, his personal tax advisor. He's very open and uh, transparent about that. And uh, one of the things that's, that's fascinating uh, to me as I travel the world, uh, Ben, is that uh, somebody will always come up to me that they, they're afraid of Robert, but they'll come up to me at some point during our conference at the end, whatever. And it doesn't matter if we're in Kazakhstan or we're in Moscow or we're in Phoenix, Arizona, somebody's going to come up and say, this is all great information, Tom, only you can't do that here. Okay. So you can do it. You may be able to do it somewhere where else, but you can't do that here. And so that's kind of my background is, I, you know, I'm very much about how you can do something. And that's why I wrote tax free wealth is this is how you can reduce your taxes legally. This is not, can you, this is not, can't you, this is how can you do it? So the goal of tax free wealth and the goal of what we do in my company wealth ability is to give people a choice of um, they can pay less tax or they can pay more tax or you know they can behave how they want but if i can tell them how to pay less tax then at least they have a decision to make am i willing to do what the government wants done so that i can pay less tax yeah and your, your company uh called wealthability and it's at wealthability.com right that is correct wealthability.com mm -hmm. So, Tom, you're also my personal tax consultant, and, and we've used your company for all of our companies, so thank you for that, and I'm honored that you, your company would take on a knucklehead like me into your world. You know, when, when, when I first read your book, and then I went down this rabbit trail of watching videos and finding you on podcasts, and, like, you blew my mind with, with your, your simple perception of the tax code. So I'd love to start today with that, that explanation, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so most people look at the tax laws. This is the scariest thing in the world. Uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, the most difficult thing in the world to understand is the tax law, income tax. So this is a scary thing. You know, they're afraid of the IRS. Oh, the IRS is gonna come get me. Here's the, but the very basics of the tax law is that it does, it has two jobs. And the first one we all know, it's to raise money for the government, right? But what most people don't realize is that that only takes about 30 pages out of 6,000 in the tax law. So it only takes 30 pages to raise revenue. Okay, here's how much tax you pay, pay tax on everything, right? That's pretty much it. So what the tax law mostly is, most of the tax law is basically a guide to reducing your taxes. It's, it's basically saying, uh, I think of it as a partnership agreement, right? It's an agreement between you and the government to say, if you do certain things, the government will provide you with certain tax benefits. So really simple example, you buy a house, the government will allow you to deduct the interest. If you rent a house, you don't get to deduct your rent. So the government's telling you they would prefer you buy a house. It's, it's that simple. Um, you send your kids to college, we'll give you a tax credit. You don't send your kids to college, no tax credit. So the government's just telling you what the government wants to have done. And if you do what the government wants to have done, they provide uh, an incentive for doing that in the form of either a deduction or a credit. Uh, even the $1,200 stimulus checks that went out, those $1,200 checks are tax credits. So it's a very efficient way for the government to get money where it wants it to go um, based on what it wants people to do. Yeah, they want you to put money into your retirement. They want you to give money to charity. They want you to create jobs. There's like a hundred examples. If you were to look at the tax code, what percentage is about paying taxes versus the percentage is about tax exemptions or tax deductions? Oh, like 0.1%. I mean, literally 30 pages out of 6,000 is about paying taxes and the rest is about how not to pay taxes. Does that blow your mind, Bob Stewart? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, 
I think most of us would think that it's the other way around. <laughs> I mean, to the uninformed, it would be like, ah, oh, they just want us to pay more taxes, pay more taxes. But they really want to incentivize us to do things that are going to spur industry, spur home ownerships, like things that government thinks are good. Well, yeah, think about it, think about it this way. Okay, so you, you get your first paycheck, right? First job, you look at that paycheck, and, and the first thing you notice on your pay stub is, who the heck is this FICA person <laughs> taking all this money out of my check, right? So what you realize very early on is that you're a partner with the government. Mm. Period. You're a partner with the government. So the question uh, that I'm always asking is, what kind of a partner do you want to be? Do you want to be a silent partner or do you want to be an active partner? We all know silent partners, you know, certain things happen. The silent partners typically, they get nothing. Okay. Active partners get to participate. So if you want to participate in building your wealth and participate in reducing your taxes, the government allows you to do that. You just have to have a little bit of financial education, read tax free wealth and, you know, have, have, you know, a good team around you. And then you can do it legally every single day of your life. What percentage or like in general, do you believe that everybody or close to everybody misses an opportunity for a deduction or a, a credit? Everybody. everybody, not even close to everybody. Everybody does. Um, we, we find that when we work with a new client, we're going to reduce their taxes by somewhere between 10 and 40% within the first three months. And that is not once in a while, that is every single time. And it's not because we're not the smartest people in the world. We just, we just are looking at this a different way. We're just looking at, we're just looking for the incentives that are right there and that most people miss because they've never taken the time to learn about taxes. I mean, Tom, would you say that that's not just most people? I mean, most CPAs, like if I just walk into a, you know, one of these places at the mall or something that'll do my taxes, I mean, they're, they're not versed in the 5,970 other pages of the code either, right? So, so let me give you the two worst pieces of advice ever. And most people have received one of these two pieces of advice at some time in their life. Um, the first one is, if you want to pay less tax, you need to make less money. And I literally hear that from somebody every month that their CPA told them, if you want to pay less month, less tax, you have to make less money. Who would ever tell somebody? <laughs> I mean, this is like, so this is really the dumbest thing ever, right? But the second one is really close to it, which is if you take this deduction, which is allowed by law, it will raise a red flag and the IRS will come after you. Well, what does that tell you about your tax advisor? It tells you, should tell you, that your tax advisor is afraid of the IRS. So, because you're talking about a legitimate tax deduction, you're entitled to, and what are they worried about? They're worried about they have to do some work to defend you uh, in front of the IRS because they're not confident that the work they're doing will be accepted by the IRS if there's an examination of their work. So anybody, anybody says, look, you have a legal deduction here, but you shouldn't take it because it raises a red flag. That would just be time to say next. That means they're really, you know, in my world, I use the word fiduciary a lot because uh, being in the industries that we're in, right? That kind of means that they're not really my fiduciary. They're not working on my best interest. No, they're no, no, the IRS is fiduciary. Yeah. Now that's messed up. Right. And, and that's why I hired you guys in, in, in addition. Right. So, so let me tell you a true story. So, so um, the current IRS commissioner actually put out a statement saying that he believed that it was a tax preparer's duty to defend the government. What? Now, no one in the tax law doesn't say that, but that's what the IRS, current IRS commissioner who used to be a tax lawyer, that's what he said. And I'm going, but that's not the law. Actually, we actually always have two sides, right? We always have a prosecution and a defense. We're the defense and we're entitled to defend what we do and entitled to apply the law the way the law is intended. Don't be telling me I can't apply the law the way it's intended. Yeah. You know, the, the philosophy of the wealth series that we're producing, the eight-part series, Tom, is to get people financially on the right track where they're living on less than they earn so that they can invest the rest that will create 
cash flow or income for them in the future and our philosophies that we all, we all kind of believe in. Uh, paying less taxes legally by understanding the tax code is one way to increase the amount of money that a family has available to pay off debt or to save or to invest every year. If, if they did none of the things that you teach and I've learned in, in your book, Tax-Free Wealth, what percentage of a family's income goes to taxes? Oh, typically anywhere from um, 40 to 60 or 70 percent is going to go to taxes. In all types of taxes, right? Yeah, because you're talking about you've got gasoline tax, you've got, um, you know, for people who smoke, you've got a cigarette tax, you've got luxury taxes, you've got, um, uh, you've got social security taxes, you have all sorts of taxes that the government, they're, they're picking your pocket. Property taxes, I got a big old property tax bill every six months. There you go. Sales tax, excise tax, there's so many taxes. Yeah. Wow. And if we follow a few basic concepts and, and we research and we become the stewards of our own money and students of, of wealth, where we go research ourselves, you're saying we can minimize that between 10 and 40% uh, is what you- Oh, e e easily. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, people ask me, well, can you really reduce taxes? And I said, well, the name, the title of the book is Tax Free Wealth. It's not tax less wealth. It's no. tax free wealth. So we do have clients who pay legally zero taxes and make millions of dollars just because they've chosen to invest the way the government wants them to invest. And they've chosen to use the money, their money, the way the government wants them to use their money. So it's, it's just a matter of having a choice and then choosing, yes, I want to pay less tax because guess what? If I pay less tax, I have that much more money um, either to spend on what I want to spend it on or better yet to invest in my future. Tom, can you just like, because I think a lot of people that might listen to this and there, there's this stigma around the, like when you say somebody makes millions of dollars and, and, and doesn't pay any tax because they're doing all the things the government said they should be doing. Just, can you address that stigma? Cause in my head, I'm like, yeah, they've got all this money. Now the third guy like Ben Kinney, they go out and provide jobs in their community and they give back, but like talk for a second about that. Cause I feel like a lot of people might have a hurdle around that. Well, so think about how you make money, right? You're an employee, you're self-employed, you might be a business owner, um, you might be an investor, right? I mean, these are different ways to make money. And, and Robert Kiyosaki actually in his book, Cashflow Quadrant, talked about four different ways to make money. Well, how you make your money um, has a big impact on how much tax you pay. A typical employee is going to be around pay around 40% of their money in uh, income tax. A uh, self-employed person is going to pay slightly more than that, up to 60%, because they're paying both the employer and the employee side of those taxes. And then a big business owner pays a lot less. Why does a big business owner pay a lot less? Well, because they employ a lot of people. Okay, they do a lot of research and development. They do a lot of things the government wants them to do. I mean, look at a, at a Tesla or an Amazon that went years and years and years without paying taxes. Why is that? Because the government gave them incentives to build those big companies. That's why they didn't pay taxes. And then the professional investor, they pay the least of all. I mean, they're the, you know, they're the ones building housing and they're the ones developing oil wells and, and building um, clean energy. I mean, those people, uh, farming, those people tend to pay zero tax. And that's just because the government says, look, we have certain things we, we know we're not good at doing it, okay? We know we're not good at doing this. We've seen government housing before. Government is not good at building housing. Okay, we all know that. So they give an incentive. You know, if they want low-income housing, they give this tax credit to build low-income housing because otherwise nobody would do it. Who would invest in oil and gas if all that risk available, that all that risk around oil, drilling an oil well, if you, you know, if if you're if just you might not get anything. Yeah, yeah. You know that. I, I think about this, Bob, I like your question because there is that stigma. Our goal of, uh, of our lives is not to fund the government. Our goal is to improve the world. And you can improve the world by giving your money to the government and, test, and trusting that they're gonna do it. Or I can improve the world by creating jobs, giving to the charities and causes that I care about, helping the environment, uh, making investments that improve the whole community, right? And I think that's a great, a great mindset to have is we're all improving the world. I'm just deciding where that money goes in my particular case. 
Right. Well, well let, me give you, let me give you a simple example that I think everybody can relate to. So let's say you bought Tesla stock um, for $200 a share. Okay. And buy a thousand dollars, you know, five shares of stock. And, and let's say now that's worth $5,000. What the government says is, look, if you sell that stock, you're going to pay tax on the difference between what you paid for it, a thousand dollars and five thousand dollars, what you sell it for. Okay. Because you're getting the money. But if you gave that stock away to a charity, to a qualified charity, you'd get a deduction for $5,000, even though you never picked up the income. So you're getting a deduction for the full value, all right, against your wages, and yet you only paid $1,000 for it in the first place. So what the government's saying is, we think charities can do a really good service in the world, and we're willing to encourage charitable giving. Just in this last CARES Act, they changed the, the rule from, you, instead of being able to give 60% of your income, you can now give 100% of your income. Well, that's just because they want more money going to charities right now. Yeah. So Tom, there's gonna to be two types of people that are, are part of the wealth series this time. There, there's the aspiring uh, learners, the wealthy, where we all started. They might have jobs, they might bought their first house, they might not have bought their first house yet, they're employees or they're just starting their business. And they need to know the basics and, and the obvious first things that they should do to improve their wealth. And then there's this other group. These people own multiple properties, they own multiple businesses, they have large retirement accounts. They're gonna need some more advanced ideas. And our goal in the Wealth Series is that people from both groups get a lot of value out of, out of this exercise. So can we start with the first group and, and focus on that and those individuals and give us some strategies for them? Yeah, absolutely. And so, first of all, understand that when I say the tax laws, the series of incentives, it is not incentives for everybody, okay? It is incentives for doing, for people who do what the government wants done. So the primary incentives are for business owners and investors. So if you wanna do something right away to reduce your taxes, the first thing you can do is start a business. You can start an online in-home business, you get a deduction for your home office, you, it can give you a deduction for your car, you can end up with deduction for some of your meals, you can get a deduction for some of your training. So the, the, the first thing to learn is that a, if, if you're a business owner, you get benefits that an employee will never get. So even if you have a job, even if you have a job, even if you have a salary, you right. should have an additional business on the side, even if it's an MLM or something, right, that, that they could take advantage of? No question. You know, you, you need to, have, now, you want to make a profit from it. I mean, that's actually one of the rules. It has to be profitable, but why not? I mean, <laughs> we've never had so many people, we've never had such a big customer base in the history of the world. Not only do we have a bigger population, but everybody's online. So it's so easy to start a business and all the tax rules are in your favor. I mean, for example, I could never deduct a meal as an employee. There is not, I, I can't think of one situation where I can deduct a meal as an employee. But as a business owner, I can deduct any meal I have that has a business purpose and that you know is with a business associate. So as long as it's a reasonable amount, I can deduct that meal. Well, that's a very different animal than if I'm an employee, because as an employee, I'm just stuck. So starting that business, now the business could be something as simple as um, buying a rental property. That could be your business, is renting property. That qualifies as a business. So it doesn't have to be an online business. It can be real estate. It could be, you know, you can invest in a, in a in an oil well, I mean, there's all sorts of different businesses that they don't require a whole lot of money to get started and they, they can produce immediate tax benefits. What are the biggest uh, tax benefits from owning a business that people overlook? Um, actually, the, <laughs> the most obvious one is the home office. And people, it, it's not always a big number, but here's what happens when you have a home office. Not only do you get to deduct a portion of your home, let's say one-tenth of your home is your home office, so you get to deduct one-tenth of your home. Well, that's great. You get to deduct one-tenth of your utilities and one-tenth of your maintenance and, you know, all that. But you, what also happens is you end up being able to deduct a lot of your car expenses because the rule is 
Your first drive of the day is a commute and your last drive home is a commute. But if you're, if you're commuting from your kitchen to your home office, under IRS rules, that's your commute. So you go kitchen, home office, you have a 30 foot commute, then that first trip of the day in the car is deductible. Now, when you come home, you go to your home office, you do your administrative work, you do what needs to be done, and then you take another 30 foot commute to your kitchen. What happens is, is now your car becomes not just a little bit deductible, but primarily deductible. And you know, cars are a very big expense of ours. And so to be able to turn that from a non-deductible to a deductible expense tends to be a really big deal. Um, you know, other things, meals, education, travel, these, there's really very little that can't be deductible under the right circumstances. There's some simple rules to follow. And once you follow those rules, pretty much anything that you spend in your business is going to be deductible. Just make sure you follow the rules. Now, what about real estate? How does real estate affect someone's ability to pay less taxes? So real estate's a bit of a, ma is, is, is kind of magic, okay? So if you're buying rental real estate especially, the government in 2017 decided to make rental real estate a preferred class of asset. And what they said was, is look, if you buy a rental property, you don't even have to build it, you just have to buy it. You buy a rental property, then we're gonna allow you to deduct somewhere between 20 and 30% of the cost of that rental property in the very first year. It's called bonus depreciation. You have to have professional advisors to do this, but if you think about it, let's say you put down $20,000 on a $100,000 rental property. Okay, you put down 20,000, the bank put in 80,000, but your deduction could be twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in the very first year. So what the government is saying is, look, bank, we're not gonna give the bank a deduction. We're gonna give you the deduction because you're the one doing all the work and because you're the one taking all the risk. And you're gonna get this big, huge deduction the very first year called depreciation. But the reality is, is your goal is to make this thing worth more and more every single year. So you've got an asset that's going up in value, so you're making more money and at the same time, you're paying less tax. What about a primary residence, Tom? So a primary residence, like I said, it's, it's better than rental, right? Because the person who gets the tax benefits from a rental property is the landlord. All sorts of tax benefits as a landlord. The person who gets the tax benefits on a personal residence is the owner of the personal residence. So you can deduct your interest, you can deduct most of your taxes, um, and then you could also have a home office and deduct e even more if you have the home office. What are some other things that individuals that might have a career or job or maybe children, Tom, or, or health expenses, what, what should these people be thinking about as, as really great opportunities to research themselves or to hire an expert to, to reduce their taxes? Well, you know, first of all, remember that, you know, that appreciated stock I talked about as your stock goes up in value, a lot of people have stock portfolios, even, you know, as, as employees, and they're not necessarily in a 401k. So I'm not a huge fan of 401ks, I, I'll be honest with you, or IRAs. And the reason is, it's called a qualified plan, which means the government controls it. Okay, and the government controls how much money you put in, what the tax consequences are when you put the money in, uh, how long it has to stay there, what you can invest in, when you take it out, and how much tax you pay when you take it out. So certain people should probably do that, but if, you, if you're willing to get the financial education like in this course, then you really don't need to do that. There are a lot of other opportunities that are better than the so-called qualified plan, 401k or IRA. Um, but that is something that you should consider. You should consider, you know, if. You know, it's kind of like when you're growing up and you're going, I don't like vegetables. Well, typically you're not going to eat them first, right? So it's better to, to wait and maybe there'll be an earthquake. I grew up in Salt Lake City, so there were earthquakes, right? So we always hoped there was an earthquake before we had to eat our vegetables. Well, the vegetables, they're not very tasty, but they weren't very tasty in the first place. So it's okay if I eat them cold. And anyway, that's the way deferring, that's why postponing taxes are. You know, it, they don't really get better with age. Right, you just are putting putting it off to a later year, and you're going. I I, I don't want to do that now. I'll pay those taxes later, um, and that's fine if you're planning to retire poor. 
right? I mean, if, if you're planning to retire with less money than you're making while you're working, then uh, an IRA 401k makes total sense. But otherwise, you ought to be thinking about things like, should I be investing in um, energy, natural resources, um, agriculture, uh, timber, um, you know, mining. I mean, there's all sorts, of, anything where you're investing directly in the asset, there's gonna be a tax benefit. So that's one thing to think about is, if I invest in a stock, I don't get the tax benefit. If I invest directly in the asset, I do get the tax benefits. And sometimes it's hard to get your arms around that, but it's like, if I buy a house, okay, I, I get my deduction, but I, if I invest in a housing company, I don't get any deduction. So it's, it's, it's like that. And all we have to do is realize that those tax benefits are available and they're available to anybody. So you can be an employee. You don't have to be, I mean, you can go invest in real estate as an employee. You don't have to, you don't have to be a professional real estate investor to invest in, in real estate and get a lot of the tax benefits from real estate as long as you have a good team around you of uh, tax advisors and attorneys and so forth. You know, Bob, Bob is more, more fertile than the farmlands in the Midwest. Like he's got kids running around anywhere. You know, you, you taught us in one of our other events that Bob could actually hire his own child if he had a, if he had a job. Can you explain that? Or if, he had a <laughs> if he had a business, yes. So here's what happens. Um, our children have something that we want. And they have what's called a standard deduction. And they have a low tax bracket. They have a whole series of tax brackets. And so if, if Bob has all these children and he goes, well, wait a minute, they have these tax brackets and they have this $12,000 standard deduction and it's going to waste every year. It's just every year you lose it. Every year you lose that, that tax benefit. So if Bob has a business, he can hire his kids to work in the business, pay his kids, he gets a deduction, but up to that first $12,000, they don't pay any tax. So this is, this is the way we can take advantage of an asset that our children have called a tax bracket, a standard deduction, and put our kids to work. I mean, you know, you think about it, and is this a loophole? And, and the answer has to be, well, of course not. Wouldn't it be great if all kids learned how to work at a young age? And wouldn't it be great if they didn't have to depend on the government or even get a job when they were older and they could actually continue their, their dad's business, continue investing and continuing those things. I think every, every parent, that's what they want for their children. And that's certainly something that the government wants for your children as well. You know, I heard Warren, Warren Buffett speak at one of his events. I traveled out there to hear him speak. And he said, hey, if I would have just put $10,000 into uh, into my retirement account when I was 16, and I invested in the S&P 500, and I never added another dollar, how much would it be worth today? And, and his answer was $52 million it'd be worth today. So Bob could actually take that money that he's paying his, his children and put it into a retirement account or a college account for the kids. They could use it that way, right? Oh, absolutely. He could go, I mean, he could go buy real estate with it. He could go invest any way he wanted to, because guess what? When you pay your children, of course, you're in control of that money, right? And in fact, you can't spend it on necessities. That's because you have a requirement as a parent to uh, take care of them. Um, but you can invest it for them. And frankly, they can't invest it themselves. So why not? I mean, it's a much better college fund than like a 529 plan. Yeah. Is there benefits right now for people to put money into health savings accounts or any of those sort of programs that a, an employee might be thinking about? Oh, for sure. I mean, a health savings account is a great idea because look, you're, you don't get to deduct all of your medical expenses. So why not deduct the very first few dollars of it by doing a health savings account? I think a health savings account makes all the sense in the world. It's basically the government saying, we'll allow you deduction to spend money on things that you're going to spend it on anyway. So, you know, those are the types of things that, why wouldn't you do that? Okay. Uh, do you think it's time to go to like some more advanced strategies for people? Let's do it. Okay. So somebody, maybe they're at a different level of income. Well, what are they missing out on? What should they be thinking about? Oh my God. One thing that comes to mind for me, Tom, is accelerated depreciation or some of those kind of tactics. 
Yeah. So once you're in, once you're already in business and you're, you're maybe you're, you're starting to invest, you really need to start looking at your comprehensive, what we would call a wealth strategy. Where are you putting your money? And is there a place to put your money that makes sense to you that would produce a major tax benefit? I mean, you mentioned real estate. Real estate's one of the most preferred of all tax benefits, but only if you take advantage of that. Let me give you an example. So um, since 2017, we've had this thing called bonus depreciation, which means that, so let's say you go buy a, an apartment building. Well, when you buy that apartment building, you're paying for the land, you're paying for the building, and we know the land doesn't wear out, so you're not gonna get a deduction for that. And we know the building wears out over a long period of time, so you're gonna get a little tiny deduction for that wear and tear. But then you're also buying the land improvements, like the landscaping and the outdoor lighting, the fencing and all that kind of stuff. And that wears out pretty fast, 15 years is what the government says. And then you're buying all the contents of the house, like the window coverings and the ceiling fans and all of those things. Well, what the government said in 2017 is, the land improvements and the contents of the building, you can write those off in the year you buy the building. So you write them off immediately. Well, that's where you end up with anywhere from 20 to 30% of your purchase price is typically for those things and you get to deduct that right away. So one of the challenges I have is that um, I run into CPAs and they'll say, um, in fact, I just talked to one the other day and he said, look, Tom, we don't do that kind of a analysis because most of our clients can't use the deductions because they're quote unquote passive losses. And I said, well, I happen to know that's not true because I know that about uh, a third of your investors are my clients and my clients can all use it because uh, e even, if you, even if you're passive in that investment, more than 90% of the time, you're able to use those deductions. You just need to under, have, work with somebody who understands the law. I mean, the reality is this is not something you do by yourself. As you get more sophisticated in your strategies, you're going to need a lawyer, you're gonna need a, a tax advisor, and you're gonna need a bookkeeper. I mean, those are three people you're absolutely gonna need because if you don't have them, um, guess what? The IRS is not gonna be happy and you're not gonna get very much in the way of tax benefits. So if you were to think about like a, a million dollar property, let's just use a round number because it's easy for us. Can you walk through like uh, verbally for us what that would look like? Yeah, so typically on a million dollar property, probably $200,000 is the value of the land. Okay. Would be pretty typical. Okay. Probably another $300,000 is the value of the building. Okay. Okay, uh, oh, I'm sorry, another 500,000. Let's say 500,000 is the value of the building. Okay. So 200,000 for the land, $500,000 for the building. Um, on that $500,000, you're gonna get to take a deduction of about three and a half percent a year, okay? So you're, you're talking about what, $5,000 a year, right? Um, sorry. 17, 17 yeah. How much is that? 17500 17500 thank you. It's a good thing I'd be, I have a calculator. It'd be sad if I were an accountant, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, so you got another set. So that's $17,000 deduction every year just for the building. Okay, now you got land improvements. Typically, land improvements run about 10% of the value of a purchase. And then you've got all the contents of the building, and that's probably about 20%. So that means of that, million dollar building about 30 percent is to contents and land improvements which that means we get a three hundred thousand dollar deduction the very first year even though we may have only put down two hundred thousand dollars on the property so we're getting a deduction for more than the amount of money we put into it mm. only only real estate will allow you to do that and that's because of the leverage that comes with real estate. That's the, of course, one of the big pieces of magic with real estate is the leverage. Now, here's the great thing about this. So you're getting these deductions. All right, so you go to sell the property. Well, guess what? You don't have to pay tax when you sell the property either because we have 
what's called the 1031 exchange, which allows you to sell it without paying any tax, or we can do a qualified improvement zone, uh, a qualified opportunity zone fund, which also allows you to um, postpone the tax, or we can sell it, recognize the gain, pay the tax, but then buy another property and get bonus depreciation on the new property. So we have three different ways we can sell a property and never pay tax and not pay tax on the gain from selling the property. There's actually a fourth way. What if we don't sell the property? What if we just go to the bank and say, look, this property's gone up in value, so I'd like to borrow against the property, use it for collateral. I'm gonna borrow against the property. Guess what? That's not taxable. That is tax-free. So we have a strategy um, that we talk about called buy, borrow, die. You, you buy the assets, you borrow against them, and then when you die, the tax all goes away by magic. It's called a basis step up. And when you die, all that income tax that has kind of grown up over the years that you've never paid tax on, it disappears when you die. So there's a strategy where you never have to pay tax and you can live your whole life without paying tax. You know, when, I, when uh, our current president was running for office, Warren Buffett and him were having sort of a battle and Warren was talking to share, say I would share my tax returns and, and he, was, he was calling the president out for not sharing his. And when you looked at, at Warren's tax returns, what blew me away was how little he paid in taxes. And, and when I started thinking about it, that's when I realized that Warren doesn't pay a lot in personal taxes because he's not cashing out his assets. He's right. allowing his assets, the value of his businesses, the value of his real estate, all these things that continue to grow, as opposed to pulling out every year and having to pay all those taxes on it, he does it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows and it wakes up to be the massive amount of wealth that, that he has today. And, and that's really what you teach us is to minimize the tax consequences from our, from our wealth building. Well, yeah, because, because the more money you have to, I mean, this is called compounding, right? The more money you have to invest, um, the faster your money grows and the more your money grows, um, you're, you're building on a bigger base. So your base keeps growing and growing and growing. And that's how you end up with, what do you say? 50, 50 some odd million dollars on a $10 million investment. Well, the same would be true in real estate. The same, I mean, you could, you can do that same math in any type of asset, but you can't do that math if you're paying a lot of tax because the math doesn't work. You know, what I realized in talking to like our local accountants and local people was I was walking into the conversation with more ideas than they had. Mm -hmm. I was asking them about accelerated depreciation and I was talking to them about tax credits for our software development. And I was talking to them about all these different things and they had no knowledge of it. They were not my fiduciary. And the only reason I knew that, Tom, was because I spent the time to read your book. And your concepts that we talk about today, we're not going to educate anybody on how to fix their taxes today. What we're doing is we're planting a seed in their mind for them to go out, read the book, hire a consultant, hire an expert so that they can go and, and be the person that understands their money. Because nobody's going to care about their money as much as, as much as we do for our own money, right? No, that, that's for sure. We actually named our company Wealth Ability for that exact reason. We, you know, the, the goal is to help you build your, create your, it's your ability to build your own wealth. I mean, no, nobody can build your wealth like you can. Nobody can reduce your tax. I can't reduce anybody's taxes. All I can do is give you a choice and tell you if you do this, this, and this, you can reduce your taxes. But personally, you know, it's, it's really not up to me. It's a partnership between me and you, Ben as to how we reduce taxes because you are the one who has to take the actions. I'm the one who has to come up with the ideas. So if you were to like give us five or 10, I don't want to call them buzzwords, but concepts that people should go Google and research and it would get them down a rabbit trail of uh, things to learn about there's one that, that there's taxes or tax exemptions. What would those be? In my mind, when I think about these great things I've learned, you know, it's things like accelerated depreciation, conservation easements, the 1202 program for, for C-Corps. Like, well, what comes to your mind when I pose that, that people are going to hear, they're going to write down, and then they're going to go have to research themselves? Well, I mean, bonus depreciation, 
is big one, of course. Qualified Opportunity Zone. That's what I wrote down earlier. I don't... Qualified Opportunity Zone. Fun, qualified Opportunity Zone. Ten thirty one exchange. What about the self insurance program of self insuring your company? Do you think? Yeah. So you know, you really want to go down a rabbit hole? Go down. Go look up captive insurance. Look up a conservation easement. Um, look up charitable contributions. Just look up charitable contributions. There's a whole industry on reducing your taxes through charitable contributions. All right. So th that by itself is a big, or, or a how about a charitable trust? Charitable trust would be um, a rabbit hole you can go down. What about uh, retirement programs? Like what kind of things should they think about if, if any, that you would send them down a rabbit trail on? So, um, you know, if, if you want to do a qualified plan, look up a qualified plan, but look up a non-qualified plan, non-qualified retirement plan, because to me, that's a much better plan because you have complete control over the taxes and what goes on in that non-qualified plan. So um, I, I would look up non-qualified plans. I look, look up uh, here. Here's one. If you really want to go down a rabbit hole, look up a rabbi trust. Okay, it's a real thing, a rabbi trust. And uh, look up a rabbi trust. Look, look up a um, beneficiary defective trust. That'll, um, that'll get you going. Just look up estate tax, estate and gift tax, or the estate tax exclusion would be another one. Um, you, you know, my, my favorite saying is probably not one that you'll find anybody else say, which is if you want to change your tax, you need to change your facts. And, you know, the, the, the whole question is, what facts do I have to change? Um, you know, I, you always look up tax-free because tax-free is going to tell, uh, for example, tax-free municipal bonds, um, tax-free life insurance. Um, there are a lot of things that are completely tax-free. And so that's a, actually a good rabbit hole to go down by itself. You know, Bob, I think that's going to be our homework question of the day. If you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts because that's what Tom's taught me. And ladies and gentlemen, Tom is, he's not just my tax guy. He's my tax coach. And we do two calls a month with his company to consult with me and my companies on my tax strategy going forward. And for a lot of you, you're not going to be ready for that, that level of service. You're just going to need to be able to find a great accountant that's been trained in the methods and been approved on the philosophies that Tom uh, uh, teaches in tax-free wealth. And Tom, I, I think that you have a resource where you can connect us to, to people all over the U.S. Uh, and maybe other places, I don't know, that are approved in your approach to taxes. Is that right? Yeah, totally. So a couple of years ago, I decided to, uh, I had a large CPA firm, decided to sell it and decided to teach other CPAs. What I've been, what what we've uh, discovered over the years, and so we have a network of CPA firms, about 40 CPA firms uh, across the U.S. And all you have to just come to wealthability.com and schedule a call with us, and we're happy to get you to the right CPA. It probably won't be based on where you're located. It's probably going to be based on what you're doing. And, and who can best help you with, uh, with what type of investing you're doing or what type of business you have. So, uh, you know, we're happy to help, you know, place people any way we can. And uh, get, they don't all charge what I charge. And so we're, we're able to deliver a lot more services to a lot more people. And I would also offer, um, if I can, Ben, if, uh, if you have a CPA, you really like them, but, and they're, they're willing to learn, but you just think they need to learn this stuff, send them to us. Um, go get a ta copy of Tax Free Wealth for them and have them contact us. And we're, we would love to have them part of our network. Our, um, our network is the fastest growing accounting network in, uh, in the country. And we're just out there to completely change the profession, completely transform it. You know, I had the opportunity, thank you, Tom, for coming to speak to a, a group of, of people in your network and talk to them about leadership and business. And it was a sharp group of individuals and the conversation was at a different level. So I appreciate you introducing me to that group. No, uh, thank Bob you. Sir, Bob Sir, what's your takeaway from today? I got a lot of Googling to do. <laughs> I think the takeaway is that, um, most of the, the CPAs that our people are doing business with are 
are probably taking an approach more like the, the the leader of the IRS, which is they're they're looking out for the government's money. They're not necessarily looking out for for our best interest. Or and I don't think it's maliciously as much as it's just they, they're they've never sat down and read this code from end to end. And and when they graduated twenty years ago, and that's what it was, and that's what they you know they haven't continued learning on this stuff, Tom. It feels like you're somebody that's just constantly in there. I mean, I think two or three times you said you know the 2017 law said this, and and the new one said this and this stuff's always changing it's a i guess at the very end of the day it's like get somebody competent and qualified ben that's my biggest takeaway well here, here's your homework as you're listening to this session is take a look at last year's tax return see how much you paid in taxes take 10 percent to 40 percent of that number and look and calculate how much that number is and then post it in our winmate group facebook group and, and tell us what would you have done if you would have had that extra money in your bank account this year? What, what debt would you have paid off? What investment would you have made? And then think about it over the last five years or 10 years. And that will be your wake up call. And this very possibly might be the most powerful episode of the wealth series for all of you. Tom, thank you for giving us an hour of your time and you're extremely generous and kind to me and a great coach and mentor. So thank you for joining us today uh, for the wealth series. Thank you. Always, always a pleasure to be with you and, uh, and your folks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Tom. Wow. I'm sitting here in the background listening to the three of you have this conversation, and I feel like